probably have a dry run for okay. his first then. Yeah, and um, I think we're going live. I'm getting it's press something that says we're going live. I believe we are live now. Um, okay. You are live. <clears throat> I'm not live. I can't. I think there's. I think there's some kind of a lag. Uh, okay, we're live. Bismillah, rahman, rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillah. Dear brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I'm Mu'azzam Beg, the outreach director for Cage. And you're joining me this evening. We are a little few minutes late because of technical difficulties uh, from uh, the UK, where I have two uh, most amazing guests uh, for our new series, uh, Uncaged Lockdown. And this is episode one. I'm going to be in conversation with our two guests here who you see uh, on the screen. Um, <clears throat> uh, Terry Holbrooks, uh, also uh, known as Mustafa, and uh, Ahmed Al Rashidi. Uh, what unites us all together, of course, is that our humanity, the fact that we're Muslims, but something even uh, more profound is that all of us, myself included, were held or were in Guantanamo Bay. And what we have for you this evening, uh, inshallah, is the first time that two individuals whose lives impacted one another in ways that are hard to, hard to describe outside of that experience uh, are speaking together exclusively uh, on this night uh, on Friday, on Juma, um, and of course, we all know uh, what's affecting us uh, and the isolation, the separation, the um, confinement for many of us in many in our homes all around the world. Um, Ahmed is in Morocco uh, and uh, Mustafa is in Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm in Birmingham, England. Yet we are all affected deeply by what has taken place with COVID-19, the coronavirus, the numbers of deaths are soaring around the world. Uh, countries that are the most powerful advocates of human rights, democracy, and so forth, are doing away with their laws uh, and introducing uh, um, uh, emergency measures in order to keep people in their homes. And I want to tell you, first of all, before I introduce our guests, is that the reason why I'm doing this particular show isn't because it's my initiative, it's actually the initiative of Ahmed al-Fashidi. He called me um, earlier last week and said that I, I haven't done that much media since um, uh, I was released, but there's one thing that I want to do now, particularly in person, as to speak to people and offer them some hope from an entirely different perspective, one perspective that few would have ever come across. And that is the perspective of somebody that's been held uh, without, against his will in incarceration but also he wanted to introduce and bring in Mustafa and the relationship, the, the unique and exclusive relationship that had been built up with Mustafa and Mustafa's own unique position in Guantanamo and to have that conversation with you uh, this evening. And hopefully at the end of that conversation, you will have left feeling um, the sense that you are not alone in this and there are people who've been able to advise you from uh, situations that would have been far worse um, had you been faced with them. So first of all, um, I'm going to ask um, Ahmed, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to you, brother. Um, can you tell me um, what is it that made you want to do this initiative and to start this discussion? Assalamu alaikum, brother Mazza. Assalamu alaikum, brother Mustafa. Uh, good evening. And uh, good, good evening, uh, everybody, uh, all the citizens of this world. I'm, to, uh, I'm addressing the whole world. Uh, you know, my uh, contribution is um, is directed to the whole world. I mean, we are we are all together in this. So uh, I'm talking to Muslim, non-Muslim, uh, the whole world, uh, because we're all in this together. Uh, uh, I felt that everybody is going through what I have been through in Guantanamo, which is isolation. And um, <clears throat> because I've been there, I know the, uh, that people are not comfortable with it. Some people are 
very sad and some people uh, you know um, you don't know how to deal with it with this situation because they've never been in this situation before and nobody had imagined that one day he would not be able to leave his home despite that he's got money and he's got a car and he's got a job and he's got business and he's got a planned uh, trip uh, to go on holiday and he cannot do that. All of a sudden, he, can, he cannot do that. Why? Because something scary outside, you know. Now, by staying at home, unwillingly, uh, that's something to do with, you know, with my experience. I mean, I, I was, you know, I was, I was denied my freedom uh, for many years. Uh, <coughs> And I was kept in isolation for like four years out of five and a half years. Uh, so I've been through it. Uh, I know it's hard. Of course, it's harder than what we are going through now because now is we are we are isolated, isolated with our with the loved ones, and we have the freedom to do food. Uh, we have the freedom to look through the window. And even to appreciate the, uh, the doctors and nurses outside, but in Guantanamo you can't do that. You know, I mean, you are locked. You're not. You have no access to to the outside world. Whether that is a sun or a sky or a cloud, or you, you're not allowed to see nothing except you are inside a big metal container. Anyway, so I really feel that I can make a contribution, helping people to go through their isolation. By giving them some advice, I think I, I can do that. Zakar Khan, thank you very much. And uh, before I go to, to Mustafa, please, I would remind uh, all, all of our viewers, uh, keep uh, your questions, keep, send your questions in. I will periodically respond to them, inshallah, in between uh, you, when you learn the stories of both of these amazing gentlemen. Um, so please keep, do, keep um, uh, posting your comments, do share, do like, and uh, get others involved in that conversation, inshallah. Uh, Mustafa, you were, as it were, on the opposite side of the wire. You came in as a United States soldier um, and you were told that we were all the worst of the worst and so forth. Um, but I've been told by Ahmed that you were different. Um, without uh, doing what Ahmed has done and, and make that difference sort of clear, you tell me in your words, why were you different and what, how did you see the prisoners in Guantanamo? Wow, uh, uh, anything I say that is beneficial uh, come from Allah and, and then anything I say that is harmful uh, come from me. That's just such a very loaded question. That, that sounds like a question to talk about my own ego, I suppose. Yeah, I'm sorry to put that to you, but if anything no, it's else- all right. it's, it's, it's all right. I think initially what happened with Guantanamo was that it was a culture shock I wasn't really expecting. Uh, growing up in the United States and being propagated the idea that, that we are the land of the free and the home of the brave, that we are the greatest nation, that we offer the best legal, so on and so forth. Um, it was horrifying. It was very horrifying to see what we were doing there. And that in itself, created a, a, a sense of isolation for me, as it seemed that many of the other guards whom I was working with didn't have this issue. Many of the other guards were able to cope with it via alcohol or, or uh, organized sports, whatever means it was, they had had some type of form of coping with it, or they simply weren't bothered by what we were doing. Um, the hopeful person in me would like to say that uh, I, I believe half of us who were there were genuinely bothered and did not believe what we were doing was right and that it was not in any way, shape, or form honorable or, or with the best interest of the United States at it. But uh, that doesn't change the sad nature that it is and, and, and continues to be a very isolating and depressing place. I, I still feel to this day sadness and and. and despair and, and wonder as to what is I can do to still help the brothers that, that are left in Guantanamo. Jazakallah khair. I mean, that's, 
Uh, look, um, both of you have um, spoken about your experiences to some degree in different ways. Ahmed has written a book uh, called The General about um, his, uh, his experience uh, in Guantanamo. And you also wrote a book called Traitor? Um, about your experience in Guantanamo. Uh, Ahmed, can I ask you first then, um, how do you first remember meeting Terry and what were the circumstances? Uh, Terry then, uh, Mustafa now, uh, he, uh, I used to try and get the opportunity, I always used to try and get the opportunity to get to talk to the soldiers about Islam. And that wasn't just me, it was the other prisoners who used to chase the opportunity in order to talk to, 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 to soldiers about Islam. I was one of them. So uh, Terry was, uh, he wasn't, he was no like any other soldier. Uh, he, he had the courage to get close to uh, the prisoners. So he didn't let that orange uniform uh, keeps him away from knowing the truth. Uh, so he had the courage to come and ask and to talk to, and talk to the prisoners and have a conversation with them. And this is what I was uh, looking for. This is what I was waiting for. You know, I was waiting for someone to have, to be willing to have a conversation with me. And do you and, remember uh, any details of that conversation? Oh, we, we used to talk about everything. We used to talk about politics, uh, religion, especially we started off with politics, blaming. I, I had my opinion about George Bush and uh, people responsible, you know, like George Bush, Rumsfeld, and, uh, you know, I, ho I always hold those people responsible. And I used to I always try to, to put my uh, point across to the soldiers and always try to tell them that you have been used by those big guys, you know, you only been used. You, you are you are doing you're only doing the dirty jobs of those guys, and I've been used as a scapegoat. You know, what I mean, I'm not a terrorist. Uh, you know, what I mean? they made me wear the shoes of a terrorist. You know, what I mean, I mean, they made me wear this orange uniform. Uh, I was so angry, and uh, you know, the only people that I could talk to is the soldiers. I know it's not their fault. Yeah, uh, I couldn't get the message across to George Bush or to, to Dick Cheney or Rumsfeld, but. I used to talk to at least to the soldiers and, you know, uh, put my points across to them. So Terry, you know, was one of those guys who was willing to listen. And, um, you know, um, he had, uh, you know, he had so much to talk about. I mean, we talked to politics and then we talked to religion and, and he, was he wasn't afraid to talk to me all the time. So and I was always looking forward to talk to him. Uh, so, okay, again, uh, before I go to Mustafa, uh, brothers and sisters, whoever's watching, uh, please do keep your comments coming in. I will be, uh, inshallah, once we get into the deep, deeper discussion, uh, answering some of the questions you put forward. Again, like, share, and please uh, get others to join the conversation. Uh, Mustafa, uh, can you give me your first impression of any particular prisoner uh, first, and then Ahmed uh, after that? Uh, your first thoughts of what you uh, felt towards them when you met them, uh, and how that may have changed over time. Oh, yeah, I'm going to put uh, Brother uh, Rahel Ahmed on blast because he was one of the first people who speaks English that we ran into in our that's organized Ruhal, tour. That's Rahel Ahmed, who's actually from about 15 miles away from where I live. He's not far away from that. Yeah. Precisely, precisely. He had, a, he had a welcoming for us, so to say. And uh, you know, he's, he was a jokester. He was a prankster. Um, there are another about other detainees, obviously, who spoke English and, and whatnot. But uh, I would certainly say, uh, just like Brother uh, Ahmed said, um, looking for individuals who are willing to engage in genuine conversation, who mm -hmm. really wanted to discuss something of significance, you know, whether it was a religion or history, politics, etc. Finding that type of conversation in Guantanamo was certainly far and few whether you were a guard or a detainee. So I always relish the times that I would have with individuals who wanted to engage in those types of conversations. And like yourself, like Brother Arachidi, like, uh, ah, so many. There's just so many that come to mind as a matter of fact. Uh, it's, it, was, it was good times. And uh, good times in a very dark place. 
you know, uh, good times. Who would have ever thought Guantanamo, which was described by, I believe, by Amnesty International as the gulag of our times, like the, the, the US, no, sorry, the, the Soviet uh, prison where thousands of people died. Ahmed, would you have described your time in Guantanamo as good times? Uh, certainly not, you know, and the funny thing is, uh, I want to go to, I, I want to go all the way to the, my last day in Guantanamo. Uh, I was, um, the last, the, the, the last time that I, the first time that I'm going to hear about my release, uh, I was called to go to this interrogation room. And the night before I had traveled with the, uh, with the earth team. We came to my cell and uh, we had trouble. And Just for our people. viewers so they understand what the Earth team is, it's the immediate reaction force team that come in yeah. wearing um, a full body yeah. armor and, and like, like anti right, anti right, anti -right yeah. you know, uh, group yeah. or, or entering a single cell, five of them with a shield. With the shield, and then they will spray with this, uh, with this gas, and, and then, they, uh, you know. So the night before, you know, I was I was at war with them, and then in the morning I was asked to come to the interrogation room. So when I went, I found a different interrogation room. It's not, it's not like any other interrogation room with a big sofa there, you know, because usually mm -hmm. interrogation room is um, a chair there and is and the interrogation room is, is cold. And, but this this time is a is nice uh, sofa and uh, I think it was a blue sofa and uh, I had people there with cameras and. The room was packed with people. And this is going to answer this question, answer your question. And the woman said to me, is there any reason why you shouldn't leave Guantanamo? I, she said, you are leaving Guantanamo. We're going to take you to Morocco. But is there any reason why you shouldn't leave? <laughs> and this is, I was laughing. I said, what? You're asking me if there's a reason why I shouldn't leave? She wants to give you, you asked you to give evidence against yourself. I don't know as she meant. She said, is there any reason why you shouldn't, you shouldn't want to go back to Morocco? You know what I mean? And I said, what, what are you talking about? So um, one time to me was, uh, was something that I've never expected in my life. I've, I've never learned a lesson from someone or heard a story about su of such impact. You know, I was in London in the kitchen cooking dishes and nice meals and thinking about how to to come up with a nice, good menu. And all of a sudden, I mean, get more, you know, I mean, in isolation and I wasn't prepared for it. I was never prepared for it. And nobody would have been prepared for that. Uh, so. Uh, but but I, I, I'm going to put to you, Ahmed, um, that there were good times in Guantanamo. And uh, one of those good times, uh, the evidence of that is, is Mustafa himself. Um, Mustafa um, Terry at the time, uh, embraced Islam and his journey to Islam began, if I'm right, in, in Guantanamo and it began with people like you. Um, so I'm going to ask you, Mustafa, the question I think that a lot of our viewers would be interested in is that what is it specifically, precisely, that brought you into Islam and how did that happen? How did that process happen? You would think that after maybe seven years of being a public speaker, a fundraiser, working with media, giving interviews, et cetera, that I would possibly have an answer to that question that is comprehensive, concise, and quick. Uh, that soundbite does not exist, unfortunately. There was so much that was going on at that point in time that it was really just quite a very surreal experience individuals from, I believe it was 46 other countries who I was able to speak with, learn the ways of life of, learn their beliefs and see common, just, just to see the commonalities amongst all of these individuals. The unifying aspect amongst all of them was la ilaha illa Allah. At some point in time, they had said this. And to me, that obviously right there was a no-brainer. That, that, that maybe there's something more to Islam than, than I have perhaps been told about in the United States or not so much told about. I can embarrassingly admit that when I arrived in Guantanamo, all that I knew of Islam was what I had seen in Robin Hood with uh, Kevin Costner 
and uh, Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. It wasn't very much, and it wasn't very accurate. So I didn't know much about Islam when I arrived, but I, I certainly, certainly was overwhelmed by the, by the experiences that I was seeing. Uh, if, if you were to put this number uh, of random Americans in a place like Guantanamo, I think one of the very first things that they would give up on would be God. Christianity or, or whatever they believe in would probably go right out the window. They, they would, it, it would be disbelief, I, I, I believe. I think that they would say to themselves, if God existed, if God was there, God wouldn't let this happen to me. I'm an American. I'm blah, 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 blah. I have all these Facebook likes. I, I, I think that uh, it was a very sobering experience. It was a very grounding experience. But the things that led me to Islam was ultimately the characteristics and the behavior of, our, uh, of a detainees with whom I was guarding. I don't believe I've ever met men of such character since. Uh, if I have, it has been very far and few. There have been some sheikhs who I've come along and, and, and I adore. But as I, as I eventually came to learn about the Sahaba, there was ultimately detainees that would pop into my mind when I would read about members of the Sahaba. So yeah, I, I, just, I can't really put it into a simple answer. That sound bite doesn't exist. Uh, uh, individuals and the characteristics and the behavior of men in Guantanamo, that, that's what moved me to Islam. Oh, that, that, that last thing just sends shivers down my spine, brother. Um, uh, can you also tell me, before I go to Ahmed again, um, can you tell me the day that you accepted Islam and, how, and, and the time, the actual moment that you accepted Islam? What happened and, how, and where were you? That's uh, almost become a comical story at this point. because I've, I've spoken about this so many times in the U.S. and Working as a fundraiser, as a matter of fact, this was something that was commonly asked. So I just decided that, you know, let's make this fun. Let's make it a bit of a joke. But uh, I believe it was the night shift, December 29th, 2003. Uh, Brother Erichidi was awake, as he was usually, awake late, reading the Quran. And when I could get time to stop with him in between counts, I, I would sit there and chat. And I had been reading the Quran for maybe two or three months prior to this point, I had no issues with it from front to back. I had no issues with what I had read. There was no contradictory of faith or reasons to, to believe in something that's just out there. It, 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 it makes sense. It's an instruction manual for living. But, but nonetheless, um, I walked up to Brother Erichidi and I told him that I was, I was pretty sure that the, I want to be a Muslim. I think I want to be a Muslim. And I remember that Brother Erichidi said to me, are, are you sure? And I, I just thought to myself, what, it's just such a strange question to, to, to pose when somebody says to you, you know, I, I want to embrace your faith. Are you sure? I, I didn't understand that it was, Brother Erichidi was looking out for me when he said that question. He knew that obviously, my subordinates, my superiors were going to look at me differently. My country would look at me differently. My friends and family would look at me differently. That, that it was a, a very significant step and, and that it's a, it, it's a huge label to place upon oneself. But uh, yes, yes, I was 19. I knew everything. I was a teenager. You couldn't tell me that I was wrong. So yeah, yeah. I um, asked him, you know, how do I do it? And he tells me that I need to say the Shahada. And I look at him like, that's it? It's that simple? I, I, I just say that and I'm a Muslim? You know, we, we don't need to light any candles or, or take a bath or, or say some prayers or do this, that, and the other. And I, uh, I gave him a three by five card and a pen and he transliterated the Shahada for me and passed it back to me. And I stumbled through saying it. Uh, ultimately, Shadu'an uh, Allah illaha illallah, Shadu'an Muhammad al-Rasul. Uh, after that, we sat and we talked for probably about another hour, and, and the, the, the material with which we covered in that conversation, it, it, it was just, it was some of the advice that he gave me were things that I, I would have never expected, and it was, it was definitely life-changing. Uh, he told me that when I got home, that, that uh, there would be communities, and then that they would tell you that this is how you should live, and that this is Islam. 
this is why you should live this way it's because of Islam. This is how you should dress because of Islam. This is how you should, this is who you should marry because of Islam. And that none of that really had anything to do with Islam. But the people who were saying these were telling me their, their, their ethnic and their cultural beliefs, their interpretations of it. And that if I wanted to know Islam, if I wanted to keep Islam, I just needed to continue reading my Quran. Over and over, when I would finish it, read it again. We talked about many other things in the course of that hour, but that really stood out the most with me because it's exactly what happened. I came home, <laughs> all kinds of people told me, you know, oh, brother, you should go and get the degree. You should be an engineer. It'd be good for you, mashallah. And, and I have no interest in engineering. No, I, I, I have an interest in people. I have an interest in making the world a better place. I, I have an interest in making connection. I, I, don't, I don't want to be an engineer, no. That's amazing, mashallah. I mean, that's uh, subhanallah. That story is, uh, though, uh, just, just to, to declare my own interest, um, uh, Mustafa has come to the UK. He visited us and he took part in an event that we did uh, in Kensington Town Hall in uh, 2009, I believe. And uh, I don't recall or don't believe us, recall asking him the question of this. So this is the first time. More importantly, this is the first time that Mustafa and Ahmed are speaking together in this context ever since the, uh, the release. So it is actually an honor, a, a great honor to be part of this. Um, I first heard, uh, interestingly, I first heard about Ahmed al-Rashidi, not by, um, by a book or by anybody else. I heard about, first heard about Ahmed Abu Imran um, when I was also uh, as a prisoner in Camp Echo. I heard about him from other soldiers because uh, I was in solitary confinement. And boy, did they have things to say about you, brother. They had lots of nice things to say about you. And you, of course, earned the title, the general. Um, so Ahmed, explain this to me. Why did they think you were a general when you'd been working as a chef in, in London? I will, uh, please, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you allow me, uh, I just want to quickly, yeah. uh, swift, swiftly, to go back to the, uh, when you ask me about the good things in Guantanamo, yeah. I didn't yeah. want to mislead the, the, the people to believe that Guantanamo is a five star hotel. Of course. So, of course. you know, yeah. uh, what be free was very hard. It was unimaginable. Okay. But the outcome, what you're talking, when you talked about Terry Holtbrook, that is an outcome. That is a bonus. So there's a difference between what I've been through is hell. Of course. You know, on earth. And, you know, you know, just briefly, you know, I mean, I, once I slipped on, I had no mattress, and there was I was punished uh, for five days, and it was extremely cold, and I was naked, and there was not allowed a blanket or, or a sheet or or, or or a mattress, and all I had is is thirty sheets of toilet paper, so I gathered those thirty sheets because we're giving toilet paper three times a day, and and uh, Mustafa knows. After breakfast, after lunch, and after dinner, ten sheets each time. So I used to hide those thirty sheets, and at night I will put them on my bunk and my metal bunk a bed, and I will sleep on them, and I'm naked. And I want you to imagine, and for those of you at, at home, somebody sleeping on on naked on a metal bed or metal bunker, and using thirty sheets of toilet paper, and they may escape. And that's, that's all I had. That's, that's the mattress, that's the blanket, that's everything. And the temperature is extremely cold. So this is why I'm telling you that wasn't, it wasn't good for me. But the outcome, of course, uh, that, that is the fruit of like uh, the, the, the conversion of, of, of Terry Holbrook became Muslim and he became active. Being a Muslim means that trying to tell the people about your faith, which is trying to tell people to guide them to paradise according to your faith. Nevertheless, it's something that you believe in. You know, as long as you contact people and try to convince people to come you to come to paradise with you, I think that's that's that is a noble thing to do. You know, what I mean, that, that, and so that was my. Uh, I just wanted to make, to clarify oh, that's, that. That's really important. Yeah, I mean, going back, yeah. <laughs> going back to the general. Yeah, the general. I, I, I used to hate this word, the general. I didn't like the word, the general. You know what I mean? I didn't like it, and it wasn't given to me by the by by the um, by uh, by the prisoners. 
Mm. It was given to me by my interrogator. And the day that it was given to me, it was uh, we, we, we were in the middle of uh, a protest about the Quran. So I was inciting the protest and telling people what to do and this and that. And uh, I was taken away from, from, from isolation and put in, in the interrogation room. And that, that was the time when the, um, the interrogator told me that he was sent as a messenger by the colony. He says, I was sent to you by the colony and your name now from now on is a general. So when he said that, I thought he's trying to tell me that I was a general in Afghanistan. So I didn't know exactly what, what he meant. And he said, no, no, no. I mean, you are the general here in Guantanamo. And that was the first time. And that was leaked by him. And the soldiers started to use the term the general. And the funny thing is, most of the time, like Terry knows, a soldier would come to me and say, General, yes, sir. And he would address me with, with the word sir. And I mean, <laughs> it was, that was funny. So they had almost believed the in old, a very, old In a very serious manner, in a very, very serious manner. You know what I mean? The, so it was given to me, the, 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 the nickname of the general, I didn't like it. Uh, the, you know, but that, that, this term was, that was you that was used only by the soldiers mm, so it's understood so people understand this properly that you were given this nickname the general it's also the name you, your, your book is and that. the reason the yeah. reason is because they think because they spoke english okay and as an innocent man finding if you are an innocent man you find yourself deprived from your freedom away from your family shackled by these people you've never met you've never harmed you've never seen before I mean, that what that what get, that what gave me the strength uh, to become a rebel in Guantanamo. I didn't, you know. I said, "Why? Who gives you the right to, to shackle my hand? I mean, who gives you the right to deprive me from my freedom?" So I was always there in the, in the head. I was always, you know, uh, you know. I mean, uh, thinking about about uh, protest doing uh, on on hunger strike. I'm always there, you know. Whenever there's a protest, I'm I'm there. So they thought that the administration, they thought that I was a leader yeah, because yeah. Um, people listen to me and people, you know, listen to what I say. So they think automatically that I was a leader, a big leader. Of yeah. course, he was, they were wrong. I wasn't. I mean, it's I was it's wrong interesting. I, I found this a, a lot. And perhaps uh, Mustafa, you might be able to comment on this. But I found this, that one of the, the title that was given to me when I was in Bagram was, was the assassin. Um, you know, I don't know where they made up these names from or what was the evidence for that. I've never harmed anybody in my life other than perhaps, you know, a little fight with my brothers. Um, but to get these labels that you're not deserved of, um, you know, Shakar Amar is a good friend of professor. mine. They called him professor, right? And, uh, you know, he's not a professor. Um, so where did this mentality come from, Mustafa? Um, why, would, why did they feel that some souls some feel that they need to do it? You remember the last time that you saw, you and I saw each other where we were? We were in Dubai. The last time me and I met were in Dubai. Right, talking with Dr. Zimbardo. Philip, Philip Zimbardo, the famous Stanford experiment, yes. Part of that uh, Stanford experiment, one of the things that he came to learn as a result of it was the dehumanization of the detainee. If you're able to dehumanize the detainee, then you're able to make it easier for the soldiers or whomever it is that is in guard, is in control, to extend their abuse and, and vile evilness with which they are capable of becoming. Uh, one method of doing that is by giving nicknames. Nicknames uh, take away your actual identity. Uh, they, they create some type of fictitious sort of, of background that surrounds you. Um, obviously, Ahmed Erichidi was never uh, riding horseback with 5,000 Taliban soldiers behind him. But, uh, you know, that's, that's what we heard of the general. That's, that's what we were told. He was, he was the general of the Taliban. The worst of the war. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, despite the war being over and the Taliban being thousands of miles away. Yes. <laughs> Okay, you know, so I'm going to go to some questions now. I mean, this is, look, I could talk to you guys forever about this because this, and, and as I said, both of you have written books. Ahmed Rashid has written The General and uh, Mustafa has written uh, Traitor, question uh, mark. Both are available on Amazon. So 
uh, you are free to, inshallah, I, I urge you to go and uh, read the books. You'll learn very exclusively from these people's own mouths about their own stories. Um, so please, please do keep your questions coming in, keep sharing, keep liking. Um, there's a sister she's asking, Aqsa Sharifa asks, um, for, uh, for Mustafa, what do you think of Guantanamo now compared to when you first went there as a guard? I, <clears throat> uh, when I was in the United Kingdom for that very short visit, uh, I made the mistake of saying, uh, in the company of another brother, I had made the mistake of saying that law spent the least amount of time and effort creating yeah, the Guantanamo. That Guantanamo was an imperfection. That Guantanamo was the armpit of the world. And he he, he reminded me of sorts and telling me that that you know Allah has made nothing imperfect. Absolutely nothing. Allah has made nothing imperfect. And it was very hard for me to wrap my head around that concept. I still to this day and have always felt that Guantanamo is a shame. It's a it's. It's an embarrassment as an American. It's 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 a shame. It's it's. <laughs> I think to put it as crudely as I possibly could, it's a skid mark on the underpants of American history. It's um, wow. it's it's terrible. I, I I honestly am dumbfounded at the fact that it, it's still open. There have been so many organizations, so many movements, you know, so many thousands of people who who have put out effort to close Guantanamo. And I can't imagine that Guantanamo is still making a great deal of money for the individuals with whom it was making money for. So that just leads to the question, why is it still open? Yeah, and um, to, to, to remind the, the viewers, uh, the brothers and sisters who are watching, that there are still 40 prisoners in Guantanamo. And so Guantanamo and, as a prison has spanned four presidential terms, uh, President Bush, uh, Obama twice, and now Trump, who has reordered what Obama uh, ordered closed to be open. Uh, so Guantanamo remains open. We have been all affected by Guantanamo on both sides of the wire. We have spoken our stories, we've told our stories, but there are still 40 people who are held in those conditions. And that's also one of the reasons why this uh, is, is important, it's unique, and I pray that you continue to um, engage with us. So a question for both brothers from a sister, Alia Patel. She asks, uh, what is the main thing that you learned about yourself through the camp. So ask uh, Ahmed Rashidi, what's the main thing that you learned about yourself from this camp? Uh, this question is, 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 is actually the core of, of my ordeal, you know what I mean? And the fruit of my ordeal. Uh, the thing that I've learned is exactly the question which will lead us to make contribution that I would like to make tonight. Uh, on the basis of isolation. Um, as I mentioned, I, did, I wasn't ready for it. I didn't know, I, I've never been to prison. I've never been deprived from my freedom. And all of a sudden I was there in the worst place on, on earth. Um, the thing that I've learned is, is a priceless. Is, you know what I mean? It wasn't a, a big, a huge opportunity for me to learn uh, about myself and especially to look back to what I've done in my past. And this is something that I think we should apply in this period that the whole world is going through, this isolation or quarantine, safe quarantine. I think everybody, if everybody puts uh, press on hold, their life on hold, and then try to think back to what they've done in their past or rewind, if you like, rewind uh, your memories to your past 20 or 30 years. Try to re-examine your past because this is your chance to do so. And this is what I've been doing in my isolation because I was so busy. Um, you know, you can do things in your isolation now in quarantine, do some exercise or do things like that, but that is a body thing. But the most important thing is the mental thing. When you, when you keep your mental state busy and you're always thinking, that what keeps you going, that what gives you the strength is the mental side of it. 
not the physical side of it. So I was busy re-examining my past. And I remember once for three days, I decided to dig deep in my past since I was like 17 years old, 16 from 16, 17 onwards. I believe you all know I've been through for three single days, you know, and I went through since I was 16 years old, all the bad things that I did. 18 years old, all the bad things that I did. 19, and then I got tired, and the next day I continued. 25, 26 years, and, and all the way to Guantanamo or to 2001. So I went through it all. And I thought I found I was I was I was I was surprised to find you know you know a mountain of mistakes that I've done in my past mountains just like we say you know you sweep the garbage under the carpet so it's a time to lift up that carpet and see what I need and this is what, what I was doing what did you do then with, with with that when you when you'd gathered all of that information in yourself and reminded yourself what did you do with that then? Believe it or not, you know when you do something bad, you know, when you're an adolescent or a young man or an adult or, you know, what, you know, you know exactly what you did. So only you who knows what you did. So I used to remember to remind myself that I used to remember exactly what I did and what time exactly. And they used to relieve it again is I did that and I did that and I will feel bad about it. I will regret it. Okay, I will regret it, I will feel bad about it, and then I will cry. So I used to feel bad about it, regret it, and then cry about it. And then I will move on to the following year, what I've done wrong during that following year. And I will think about the bad things that I did, okay? And I will regret it, and I will cry about it. And, then, and it took me like three days, believe it or not, three single days, three long days, and I was crying. And, but you know something, I will throw every bad thing that I've did in my past. And it's amazing, you know, when you do that, you feel really, you, you feel free from inside, you know, you, you know, you feel like if, you know, you, you, you were born, you, you know, you knew you are a newborn. And uh, after a long cry for three days, I felt better. Okay. Now I know what I've done. I did hold myself accountable. Okay. So I think during this isolation or quarantine, I think every one of us has the chance to, to look back what each, each one of us has done in the past. And uh, maybe, we've, and, and I'm certain that we will feel better. Everybody will feel better afterwards. And um, Mustafa, so I, I wanted to, to ask you, you, you saw a lot of the prisoners in these various stages, some, um, it, you know, speaking as Ahmed has, uh, others in more isolation, others in communal blocks. What was happening in your mind when you were going back home, uh, when you were going back to, to the, the barracks or wherever it is you were going to in, in the rooms? Um, what was happening in your mind once you'd become a Muslim? Uh, that was the first question. And the second question is that, um, how were other soldiers reacting to, to that, to you becoming a Muslim? Okay, uh, I was able to keep that pretty much to myself for a surprisingly large amount of time until it was maybe a month or two before we were getting ready to go home. And when we were that close to getting ready to go home, nobody honestly cared what I was doing any longer. Nobody cared what anybody was doing any longer. I'm sure as both of you can attest to, you, you knew when certain guards were getting ready to go home, they just stopped caring. Then you knew when new guards came because they didn't know how to do anything at all. So, and thank you both for teaching us how to do our jobs in Guantanamo. As again, we did not know how to do it when we arrived. As, as for, for the first question, I think one of my uh, uh, biggest realizations when I was in Guantanamo was that I do not know anything. No matter how much I think I know, I, I do not know anything. I, there's there's so much more out there to learn than, than, than I, I had ever possibly even imagined. Uh, having the opportunity to talk to people from 46 different countries and, and to see the, the 
hear about the ways of life from, from all of these different places. It was so amazingly different from anything that I was taught in this country. Uh, when I arrived and I say, I mean, I know nothing. I, I mean, I, I had been lied to. We, we, have, we have a media here that does a great job of teaching us and believing us uh, and conditioning us into a certain way. And Guantanamo was just such an eye opener. It was such an experience to really see that, that, that I, I have not been told the truth. I am not being told the truth every day. Uh, the people that I am defending, the people that I signed up and enlisted and cared mm -hmm. for, they're not being told the truth. They, they don't know what's really going on. None of us do. And uh, if anything, I, I think what I most learned about myself in Guantanamo, aside from not knowing anything, was that I, I somehow no longer was afraid to stand up to being the only person in the room saying I disagree or no, or, or this is wrong. And did that get you into trouble? Did that ever get you into trouble? Obviously, there, there was a, <laughs> a good number of times that that, that created issues for me. But what I mean by that, I, I, just to kind of make this relatable for all ages, uh, you know, when I was a, a young adolescent, you know, you do things that other young adolescents are doing that you know is wrong, but you do it with them because it's part of the group. Uh, when you're a teenager, you give in peer pressure, perhaps, on, on occasion. And again, this is just being part of the group, wanting to be accepted. And uh, it takes a great deal a great deal of, of courage at times to say no, say I, I don't agree, or I'm not going to do this, or this isn't right. Uh, I, I, I had violent, violently ill reactions to being on the earth team. I, 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 <laughs> there's only two occasions ever in Guantanamo that I, I, I earthed. I, it just it was not something that I enjoyed. There were plenty of other guards who loved it, who, who, who run to the opportunity to do it but it, it was just something that you know i i, I started feeling that that, that that you know this isn't right this isn't good this isn't human this isn't humane you know subhanallah you remind me of the, the prophet sallallahu said in a famous hadith from whoever from amongst you sees an evil let him change it with his hand and he's unable to do that let him speak out against it and if he's unable to do that at least let him hate it in his heart and that is the that is the weakest of, of things to do so subhanAllah, that that's, seems to me that that is what moved your heart. Um, Ahmed, uh, the, the, uh, there's a question by one of the, the, uh, um, the questioners. Um, it's, they're asking whether, who is the longest serving prisoner in Guantanamo? Now, I'm not really t totally sure how to answer that because obviously it would be the 40 who are still there. And that includes several uh, several people. Some of the high value prisoners includes Abu Zubaydah, Khalid Sheikh, includes the uh, Hosawi, it includes many Ahmed Rahim and Nashiri. It includes, uh, includes many other prisoners. Um, so essentially, those who are still there are the longest serving ones because they're not free yet, and it's now uh, coming up to it's eight, eighteen years plus. Mm -hmm. uh, I also want to give a special salam to uh, Mansour Adeifi, who is watching us from Serbia, and he's a former Guantanamo prisoner of Yemeni origin, who was okay. recently to Serbia uh, in Belgrade, which is where he is, and we've spoken several times. And he's done a lot of work uh, in highlighting the prisoners' cases from the artwork that they've produced. Um, this is, I think, both, uh, uh, this is after all of us left Guantanamo, the prisoners were able to do artwork and give access to things um, that have been showcased uh, in various galleries around the world. So Mansour has been very active. He's written articles um, and he's still uh, fighting the cause of, of the Guantanamo prisoners, even though he's a stranger in a strange land in Belgrade, where he has no connections to at all, but that's where he was resettled to. I just wanted to make that point because uh, I've seen him saying salam to us and saying that, uh, wishing us very well. Um, please, brothers and sisters, we're coming closer to the end, but I've, I, I did say that I was going to do this for about 45 odd minutes, but as I said also, that this conversation is one that uh, has been a long time in coming, it's coming this evening, Friday, uh, at the height of the coronavirus uh, scare around the world. People are infected, people are dying in their thousands, and we want to be able to contribute from our own experience, um, something that you may be able to benefit from. Uh, 
please continue with your questions. Uh, we have still have time for, for a few more uh, and continue to share and like uh, as much as you can. Uh, and make sure that can share on this. Yes, Ahmed, Bismillah. Yes, uh, the, 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 just the previous question, you know, that, that was just one of the things that, uh, you know, is a, is, a, is a big question, of course, it's a very, very big, massive question. That was just one of the things that I've learned about myself or trying to, to learn by myself. But, you know, the other thing that which uh, contribute to, to our program tonight is, is uh, I've learned that I used to take things for granted before my imprisonment. I never cared about the, the good things in life and simple things in life. I never cared about them. You know, those things that we all enjoy, uh, those simple things that we always take granted we, we take for granted those things that I, I was deprived of i've learned that that i um, i really really i never was grateful for those things uh starting from uh, from uh, sleeping at, at home and having you know when you turn the lights off and enjoying a dark night that, that is very, very simple thing that we do every night, but we don't, we don't pay attention to. But in Guantanamo, the lights are on for 24 hours. You don't get the chance to turn the light off. So this is very simple. None of us, when we go home, when we go to, to bed at night, none of us, when we turn the light off, just put your finger, your thumb on the switch and the light is off. We don't think about that, that darkness, okay? We don't think about it. None of us think about it. But it's, it's a massive, uh, you know, good things in life that you enjoy a good nice sleep. In Guantanamo, that we were not allowed to turn the lights off because we don't control the lights off. The lights were on for 24 hours. So I knew what it meant to have a dark nights in your room. So, so this is one of very simple things. Never, n never mind. I mean, the sun and the air and the, you know the, the other things. Uh, I mean, the, this is something. Them. Yeah, I want to make a point on this because it's really important. I mean, the point that you're making, Ahmed, is that you never appreciate something until it's gone. Mm -hmm. You never appreciate freedom until you're imprisoned. You never appreciate youth until you're older. You never Very appreciate simple. Very simple. Being, being healthy until you're sick. Very um, simple. And you never appreciate, uh, you know, your free time. Uh, until you're really busy. And this Absolutely. is all based upon the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, take care of five before five. And the biggest thing he said on this, of course, he said that take care of your life before your death. And this indeed is a, is a great reminder for all of this. Um, that, you know, subhanAllah, the things that you've just said now, uh, we know, I used to say to myself, you know, if, if uh, the Americans were to place me inside a house, when I had access to everything in the house, but I wasn't allowed outside of the house, only maybe to a small garden, mm. I'd be happy. That would be sufficient. Mm. <laughs> and that's how I used to think. And I still think that way. And that's why coronavirus and the kind of lockdown hasn't hurt me in that way because mm. my, my expectation was always, if I can be in a house and have the freedom to move inside that house, to turn on the switch, as Ahmed says, to open the tap as you want, to open the door, to open the window, to have a window, uh, all of these basic things, and to not have somebody watching you 24 hours a day. Uh, if you, if you, could, if you could just, if you could just allow me, please. Uh, it's very, yeah. very important. I, I need to mention this because uh, you mentioned the, uh, we, we just mentioned the, the dark, the darkness. Uh, you know, uh, for, for those who, who are feeling really depressed. We all are, you know what I mean? To some degree, everybody's feeling depressed to some degree, uh, depressed uh, because of the uncertainty, you know, and there's a fear. But there is a philosophy that you can apply to this situation. You always ask yourself and convince yourself that it could be worse, okay? Just ask you, just tell yourself that it could be worse. Meaning, yeah. okay, you are at home now, okay? And now we all in this together, the whole world is experiencing the same thing, regardless of the wealth, fame, money, religion, it doesn't matter, you know what I mean? This is, I've, I, this is a test. This is for all of us, just a reminder that we are human, a reminder that we are one nation, one family, one nation. 
because we're going through the same thing. I mean, all those boundaries don't exist anymore. You know, I mean, uh, different religion, different faith, language. It doesn't matter who you are. We all locked at home. Now, just think it could be better. For example, now you've got the light on. Can you imagine if you just turn the light off? Where you are now, at your home, you will make it worse. Or keep the light on. When you sleep, turn, don't turn the light off. Just keep the light on. You will be very, very uncomfortable. You see, so you could make it worse in your bedroom, in your home, where you are right now. So you could make it worse by keeping the lights on. You could make it worse by putting the, heat, the extremely cold temperature on. You could make it worse by depriving yourself from the food from the fridge. So you can make it worse or you can make it better. So always think that it could have been worse. So this way, psychologically, you will feel better. Exactly. And you will, you will deal with it in a better way. Uh, so we have, a, before I go to uh, Mustafa, a, a, a message from Um Amara who's saying, Assalamu alaikum, pray you're all well. Um, how are the brothers in prison dealing with the global pandemic coronavirus? Um, to my knowledge, uh, there have been cases, or a case at least, of uh, coronavirus in Guantanamo uh, with some of the soldiers. I don't believe that any of the prisoners have been affected, uh, infected, to my knowledge. I believe the distancing, distancing already exists to a great degree. So it's going to be hard for them to get infected. The guards already back, you know, 15 odd years ago used to wear gloves and pr other sorts of protection uh, to ensure that they're away from any, any, anything, uh, any direct contact of the physical prisoner or, or any of the fluids and so forth that might connect them. Uh, so I'm sure they would have doubled or even tripled down on, on that. Uh, what, what's your experience of that? What do you think Mustafa, uh, in terms of protocol, military protocol, um, how would, was there any training about uh, any viruses, epidemics, and what you might have to do? Again, thank you both for training us when we <laughs> arrived in Guantanamo. Uh, you know, we were told that uh, you guys could have anything and everything. So make sure that you wear your rubber gloves. Be sure to cover your name out of, uh, I suppose, out of fear that if you should ever happen to get released, you might Google us and then find out where we live and take action against us. I don't know. They, they, we had some strange things that we were doing, but uh, um, I'm pretty sure after maybe a month, a month, two months tops, that uh, I stopped at the rubber gloves and everything else that was there. It was just absolutely absurd and ridiculous. You, know, uh, you guys were just humans. Yeah. We're humans. I, remember, I was a human. It, 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 it's, there was no difference. It, was, it seemed silly to me. We were going I remember to the soldiers in a situation where soldiers were going to potentially become infected with, situation, with, with, with infectious viruses and diseases and die. I'd be willing to even say now that the detainees in Guantanamo are probably the safest individuals. <laughs> I know that sounds absolutely crazy to say, but uh, they're not going to be having soldiers who are going to work or sick. They're not going to have soldiers who are sick or feeling sick even around other soldiers. So again, the guards or the detainees are likely the safest individuals in Guantanamo at this point. Exactly. Um, so yeah, I remember. I remember myself. It was a really strange feeling that somebody's putting on gloves to touch you at that time, and not to do any medical examination, but simply to hold your arm or to you know move you around or to drag a chain it, it it's felt violating to, to me at the time that they need to put gloves on to 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 touch me um but i guess that's um that's all in the past now although it exists still as i said for 40 other prisoners and we're coming close to the end of our time um we were actually if i could i, I just want to interject um, my wife asked me to give salam to both of you and my to everybody else who is listening and I would just like to echo something that, that, that she has said to me recently this week, and, and it goes back to what you had said not that long ago. Uh, Allah has given us health. Allah has given us free time. We have both of these two things, and we are in a place where we are comfortable during this quarantine. These are two blessings from Allah. Rarely does Allah give us free time, health, Place to be safe, these, these, this is a blessing. It all depends upon how you should choose to look 
at this quarantine. Some detainees who may remain nameless have said to me in the past, no, I do not uh, 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 feel horrible about the experience of Guantanamo. When else would I have had three, four, five years away from my kids? I was able to memorize the Quran. I was able to learn a new language. I was able to, I've heard some, some, some very wonderful things from people about how they should choose to treat isolation and, and this type of social distancing with which we are under. And it's really all in your outlook. Jazakallah khairan, that's very important. That's always been my philosophy. I've always said that I was away from my children for three years. I saw my youngest when he was only three years old. Um, and I used to say that uh, the day I remember when I memorized one of the, the largest surah in the Quran for me was the best day of my life. I, I could never have done it anywhere else. So I used to jokingly in, in an event, I'd say, you know, I'd like to thank the FBI, the CIA, MI5 and everybody <laughs> else for giving me this opportunity. You don't realize how, how much I gained for myself. Um, Okay, before we end, I'm going to ask both of you to give us two little pieces of advice, whatever they are, practical or theoretical, that you could leave our viewers with uh, to ponder over as food for thought. So, inshallah, Ahmed, if you can give us two pieces of advice you want to leave our viewers with, um, please go ahead and tell us. Um, I think it, the title would be, the title would be uh, a New Faith, uh, a New transformation it has to be a transformation a new approach to life after this crisis it should be a new approach to life and we should not take things for granted like we have mentioned and uh, it has to be a, a new approach a new and a serious transformation to how we view this life as a whole. And this is our time uh, to, to do that, to, to go from faith, from, 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 from past life to our future, but with, with, with a new approach and a new vision to the future. And a second thing, is there a second thing you want to say? I think I did put all of them in one, in one bag. <laughs> uh, and Mustafa? Any any points to at least two or, or one? Mustafa. I would like to, I, I suppose, echo uh, uh, Brother Irachidi. Um, inshallah, we are able to leave this pandemic in high numbers. Inshallah, we are able to leave it as stronger nations, as nations who have hopefully worked to some degree to destroy the racism which may exist in their countries. Uh, nations who have hopefully worked to some degree to come together as stronger communities, as more accepting and better people. Uh, as I had said in the very beginning, what, what led me to Islam was the character of the detainees. And I think personally, and, 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 I, and it's open for argument or discussion, but I think many of you may not have been as amazing of individuals as you have turned out to be had Guantanamo had never happened. And, and I, I think that that, that time out, that, that, that displacement from the life with which you were living, that displacement from the reality with which you had placed yourself and you had thought yourself up in, that time out, so to say, that Allah gave you allowed for all of you to, to recalibrate, to test self-inventory, to improve and to become better individuals, become amazing individuals. Uh, following that example, I think would be the best thing that we can do with this pandemic, with this virus, with this situation that we find ourselves. We should take time to inventory, to, to reflect, to see what it is about ourselves that we do not like, and to try to confront that. And hopefully we will come out of this, inshallah, as, as, as stronger and better people. Uh, Jazakallah khair to both of you, uh, Ahmed Rashidi uh, in, in uh, Morocco and uh, uh, Mustafa Terry Holbrooks in Phoenix, Arizona. I, I can't add anything further than that. I think leaving on that note is the most positive, most directional uh, note that we can leave our viewers with to think, to contemplate. As I said, this conversation is one 
that um, has come at a deeply timely occasion. Uh, I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts both of your efforts for Ahmed for initiating it, for Mustafa for taking part in it, and for all of the brothers and sisters who helped to set this up from cage uh, to Allah to accept um, their efforts. We'll continue inshallah and return again next Friday from uh, one of our colleagues in cage to speak to you through um, this, this uh, uh, initiative that we've begun. Uh, cage will continue also to update you uh, through various um, times in the week, uh, through live streams and through posts and so forth. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eases this burden from us and lets us emerge from it far stronger and better than we were before. And in the words of both brothers, be able to reflect on our past in, a, in order to make our future better. Wa jazakumullah khair wa subhanakum wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa utubu laik wa jazakumullah khair to all our viewers. Oh my God. Oh my God.